Hello, everyone. My name is Jim. I am a developer advocate at Harness. And welcome to the first drone office hours. Uh, so this is um, something we're starting where we want to have conversations with folks in the drone community and you know, kind of showcase what's going on in the community. And yeah, just have uh, some good conversations around uh, all things drone. So my guest today, very excited about is Stefan from Achievers. Hey there. Yes, hi Jim, thanks for having me today. Yeah, thank you so much for being here for this first drone office hours. So um, yeah, how about uh, we start off with um, getting to know you a bit better? Sure, yeah, so I'm Stefan Kloznikovich. I'm a principal site reliability engineer at Achievers. I've been in the industry for about 20 years now, I've been using Linux, mostly around large distributed systems using OpenStack, building private clouds for telcos, uh, you know, doing a little dabble in security, things like that. And uh, most recently, I've been doing a lot of work with Kubernetes. So, you know, building out Instacart's Kubernetes, I was there before I started at Achievers. And then I got hired at Achievers to help them do cloud migration, focus heavily on Kubernetes, Istio, and all the CI CD tooling that you need to kind of move from a monolith to microservice architecture. And how long have you been there? I've been there for three years now. I think it was my anniversary last Friday. So yeah, I'm pretty awesome. excited to be, be there for three years. We've grown so much in three years too. Like it's it's been pretty wild how when I first started, we had this giant monolith and then we've expanded to microservices and we've expanded around the world too. We're not just in one active region, we're in three active regions. So we've really built out our infrastructure a lot in the last three years. Great, it sounds like a, a lot of companies are following a similar path, I think, which is great. Definitely. Um, so um, what can you tell us about Achievers? What do they do? Yeah, Achievers is a really cool company. We're especially, you know, we've been through COVID the last few years and everyone wants to find their place in a company and find belonging, a sense of belonging and really build that culture out. And that's really the heart of what Achievers is. Achievers is about recognizing your employees for the good work that they do and building culture and, and relationships between employees. Um, I actually have a really cool story to tell you about this because it just happened again, like in the last two weeks. Um, my cousin's actually a client, like he, he works for a company that's a client of Achievers and I'm scrolling through his Instagram the other day and I see a recognition on our platform. And I've never actually seen somebody post anything on Instagram before about our platform, like seeing our actual platform on someone's Instagram. And he had a recognition there from a coworker at his, his company that sent him a, a recognition on something very good that he did and showed he was very proud of it. So he put it on Instagram and it just blew my mind. And it made me feel really good that you know, the work that we're doing here at Achievers is actually impacting the real world, even my own family. And I didn't even know that, you know, they were working for a client of ours. So that was really cool to see. So, you know, the core of what Achievers does is employee success. We want our employees to succeed. Awesome. Yeah, I think I've used a um, similar tool set at another company. And, and we have one too that I've, I'm forgetting the name of the one that we use, which is horrible. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's a nice way to recognize your coworkers, right? And um, showcase things so that they don't, so they sh you show your appreciation for what folks are doing in your company, right? Yeah, and we can leverage data and recognition to help bring that relationship closer between employer and employee and just like employees together. Very cool. Yeah. Um, I really enjoy so, working here. Yeah, it sounds great. You were telling me about uh, the office that you're in. Uh, well, 
maybe we should talk about that. Where are you located? Yeah, so we're up in Toronto, Canada, and we have an amazing office. Like I'm, I love coming to work now. Like I, my dog's sad that I'm not home anymore. I have two dogs, but you know, the office is really cool. I, I think the person who designed the Facebook Canada office also designed our office. Uh, we, we've had employees that show up to the office that haven't been here before. And they're like, what? We have three floors. Like some people that got hired during COVID don't actually realize, you know, how big Achievers is, how many employees we have, how, how cool we are. We have this amazing office. It's, it's pretty cool. We have a live wall of greenery. It's all these plants growing out of the wall. Um, you know, we have bean, bean bags all over the office. Uh, you can write on all the walls. It's, it's pretty neat. Right on the walls. Nice. Yeah. They're like whiteboard walls. Yeah. <laughs> Dry yeah, erase markers. This one is clearly not, not Sharpies. <laughs> we have other ones. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so the reason why we have you today and why we've got gotten to know each other a bit is that Achievers uses drone. Um, so uh, do you know about how long Achievers has been using drone? Yeah, I was actually the one to bring drone into the mix. Um, when I first started, we, we were kind of on this journey. Uh, like Achievers was on a giant journey. We needed to migrate from monolith to microservices due to a bunch of business objectives that we had to hit. Along with that, we had to move faster. We were very slow to move new products out and make changes. So we needed to rebuild all of our tooling for that reason as well. Also, we wanted to containerize things and to do that, we needed a tool to, to build uh, containers. And, you know, we, we did have Jenkins previously, but Jenkins is kind of the Swiss army knife. It does everything. It's a little bit bloated. We wanted something simple and easy. And that's what really drew us to drone in the first place is how simple it was. You know, you basically need a little bit of Linux background and you can get rolling and starting writing your own steps. Um, so yeah, we've been using it for about three years now since I, I first started with Achievers. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I used Jenkins for many years, uh, even used it before it was called Jenkins back when it was Hudson. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was great at the time, but it's, it's definitely not my preferred solution these days. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, it was just such a struggle to keep it up to date with all your, you know, plugin interdependencies. Uh, I'm sure it's gotten, I should, I should say I haven't run it for a few years now. So things might've gotten better, but I just remember years of, um, you know, having to maintain, uh, you know, the, the operating system level to make sure that the dependencies that people needed were installed. Um, you know, you were always a blocker to somebody that wanted some new updated version of a, of a dependency or a plugin or, you know, something like that versus drone where you can just kind of bring your own Docker containers. If, as long as you can build a Docker container or you can, uh, you know, run the steps in your Docker container to install what you need, then, uh, yeah, there's no, uh, that, that, that level is now out of your, uh, your, your, your workflow where you don't have to care about what's at the host level uh, as if you're running in containers. So yeah, yeah it, it really sped up a lot of our, our workloads and stuff too. We've been doing some migrations of, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about this more in depth later, but we've been doing a lot of migration from, you know, our monolith to microservices over the last few years. And as part of that, we're also getting out of data centers and moving everything to the cloud and, you know, moving drone, sorry, moving Jenkins pipelines to drone has been a real thing for us. We even still have some of the monolithic uh, repos pipelines running in drone and we're almost migrated everything out now, which is great, but that's been a journey alone is trying to translate Jenkins into drone and some of the team who has actually worked on Jenkins for years has had a little bit of a learning curve that they have to jump over to start working with drone. It's not necessarily 
complicated. It's just a learning curve and things are done a little different. You have a world of tools, right? With the Swiss army knife that is Jenkins that you might not have everything in drone. Yeah, I definitely see where you're coming from where you, I feel like you also really need to know, you can't rely on anything that someone else has done before. Or you, I'm not trying to phrase this well, but like, yeah, you, I feel in drone, um, it's much more uh, hands-on as far as like, I need to know what steps I need to install, what dependencies I need for my application uh, so that I make sure that I'm running them. I'm running the right Docker container. I'm running the right commands to get what I need. I can't just rely on something someone did to bring up a server, uh, right? Um, maybe someone built a Docker container for me. Maybe I have less to think about that way, but um, yeah, it, it really helps to uh, encourage a deeper knowledge of what's going on in your CI system, I feel. It's, um, it's been a big change for process too. For example, when we when I first started, we had a whole team dedicated to just looking after Jenkins, right? Watching pipelines and and when the pipelines would break, the developers would just go to the team that manages Jenkins and say, hey, fix this for me, it's broken. And Achievers has been through this now for the last couple of years and we've put into the mindset of engineers is you should unblock yourself where possible. And since the pipelines now live within their source repos themselves, they're in charge of their pipeline from start to finish. We have guidelines and we have, we're the escalation point, but they really get to focus on what their app needs. They can write it themselves. If things break, they can fix it themselves. We've moved to this more developer um, in control of everything to production mindset. Yeah, that's DevOps, right? Here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. empowering your developers to uh to do that yeah cool so um you said you mentioned that uh you were involved with bringing drone into the company um are you on the team actually running drone these days yeah we don't really have a clear ownership i guess like of drone um we have a couple teams that manage it under the umbrella of SRE and platform tooling. Uh, so it's kind of all of us as a whole that own it for the developers. Now, as I mentioned before, we're more the escalation point and we handle the infrastructure. So we've built it out. We work on performance uh, enhancements to drone or the runners. Uh, that's more our team, but definitely if it's anything with the pipelines, that's more the engineers themselves that handle those issues. Cool. Um, can you give us an idea then what the architecture looks like for you guys? Yeah, we, I, I feel our architecture is pretty similar, but I don't, uh, it's similar to other people out there, but I don't really know uh, what other people have per se, uh, but we have our main drone server and we run as much as we can in Kubernetes. So we have Kubernetes runners. We actually were one of the first well, maybe not one of the first, but we were using it very early on the beta of this secondary version of the Kubernetes runner. Uh, there was an early one that existed, I think for 0 0.08 drone. And then when one came out, there was a new Kubernetes runner. That's when we really started getting on board with Kubernetes. Um, we did run into a lot of performance problems at that point in time. So we had to use the Docker runner as well to get better performance. At the time, the Kubernetes runner was still in beta. So we had a lot of performance problems, especially running integration tests, uh, things that needed more time to spin up. There was some problems with the early iterations of the beta. We filed a couple bug fixes and uh, you know a couple issues at the time. Uh, and then eventually it sorted itself out. So we started using the Kubernetes runner more. We actually have two node pools that we run today in Kubernetes, uh, one with smaller machine types and one with larger machines types to give us a little bit more processing power when we need it. Uh, so we basically have the main drone server. We have a couple runners in Kubernetes and we also have a Docker uh, runner as well that we use to spin up VMs 
and everything scales down when it's not in use. We, we want to save money. We want to save those resources. So we have, uh, we have everything scaled down when it's not in use. It's great. Are you um, in AWS or Google or? Yeah, we're in provider? Google um, and that's what we've been using with our integrations with drones since the beginning. Got it. So um, when you say the Kubernetes runner, that's the, in your pipeline, you define type Kubernetes, right? So that each step in your pipeline runs as a pod in Kubernetes, correct? Yes, exactly, yeah. Yeah, that's great that that's been working out well for you. Um, that is, um, I should maybe mention that there's uh, the, the, the most uh, popular, I guess, uh, runner is the Docker runner, um, which now we've put out a Helm chart so that if, if for some reason the Kubernetes runner isn't working well for you, um, this, runner now might be the example or this Helm chart to run the Docker runner uh, in Kubernetes uh, might now be an option. Uh, it actually uses the Docker and Docker container as a sidecar and talks to that. So that's how it launches containers. So they're no longer pods that, well, no, yeah, that's correct. They're not pods, they're actual containers running launched by the Docker and Docker. So, so that was a recent, uh, uh, improvement that um that i got to be part of i might have to take a look at your helm yeah. chart because i think we may have in in-house our own helm chart for the the docker runner so i'll have to take a look at that yeah i was glad to uh be able to take that on recently and uh, make some improvements there to the drone server helm chart and adding this new helm chart uh it had hadn't seen much love <laughs> for a little while uh, so yeah that was since I've started at Harness, um, that's one of the uh, one of the projects I was able or drone projects I've had, you know, been able to make a decent contribution to. I was I was happy about that. Um, so in your architecture, um, do you know if you're using any extensions uh, that like maybe the server talks to or runners might talk to? Yeah, that's actually how I recognized your name because we use one of the uh, plugins that you actually wrote at a previous place, um, which is file paths. We, so we, we saw your name kind of kicking around there for, for a while. And um, that was one of the repos that we've actually contributed back to. I think you actually merged in uh, some of the PRs that we opened up against uh, that tool. So yeah, very cool. Oh, that's great. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, I was at a company called Meltwater before, and uh, I wrote this conversion extension. Uh, so there are multiple types of extensions in Drone. One is a conversion extension, which when the YAML is received from your source control, uh, it can, Drone can optionally hand that YAML off to a conversion extension. And that extension could do anything it wants to manipulate the YAML and then pass it back to the drone server. So what that, this is the paths changed conversion extension. What that does is reaches out to the source control because in the webhook that you get from like GitHub or you know another solution like GitHub, GitLab or uh, Git, I believe, I don't think any of them will tell you, will, will send in the webhook the list of files that have changed. Um, since that information is not there in the webhook, uh, this extension can go back out to the uh, API of the source control service and ask it, hey, what? Because it will, in the webhook, there, uh, there is the previous hash and the next hash of the commit range. So it can go, the, the extension goes back out and asks the API, hey, what files changed between these two revisions? gets that list and then based on rules that you put into your drone YAML around what steps should be included or excluded based on those files changed, then your pipeline step will either run or get skipped. Uh, so yeah, that's the background of that extension that was that was fun to write. And I'm glad that like, it seems that it, it's gotten a lot of adoption and uh, it's worked well for people. Um, that, was, that was actually our, our problem. And we ended up writing something 
in-house, basically a script to do that, right? It would just grab the diffs in Git and do a comparison and then run only on the files that changed. We kind of had like a script poor man's version of that. And we thought, hey, it should just be in the tool to begin with or, you know, have some extension of the of drone. Uh, so that was great that we found that and it helped speed up our pipeline significantly. Uh, it saved a lot of time because we didn't have to run through every single test maybe that gets changed because, you know, you're only making change to one directory. Uh, so yeah, this, this is great. Thank you for that. Thanks past Jim. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. <laughs> um, and I, I still have some uh, improvements in mind for that, that uh, I, I'm still uh, a contributor on the project. Uh, and I have a contrib I have something in mind that I, oh, why don't I just share it now? Um, so uh, a newer version of a drone that was just put out um, now has the ability to send the token uh, out to the conversion extension. Uh, so right now, if you're using that extension, you have to manually generate a token, uh, like in GitHub. Um, and that token, you know, you have to, it's not good practice to make a token that never expires, right? But if you make one that never expires, you have to go and rotate it. If you're only, you know, going to generate it for like maybe 30 days or something, mm -hmm. every 30 days you're having to manually rotate it, or maybe you automate it somehow. Now the drone server, because it has, you know, your OAuth app credentials to your uh, to your source control tool uh, application, um, it can generate that token and pass it to the conversion extension. So that will be a, hopefully an upcoming improvement in that, in that uh, extension is that you won't have to pass the token anymore. So, so keep an eye out for that. Cool, yeah, once definitely. I get, well, once I find some time to work on that. Um, as we were just talking about that, I thought of, uh, maybe I'd share the story as to why we originally wrote that, not that, that plugin, which I, goes back to Jenkins <laughs> again, because we, at, this is back when I was at Meltwater, um, we had multiple data centers and we had a Jenkins that would, we think we used the DSL plugin, you know, so we had a lot of scripting around uh, generating pipelines for teams to have you know, their applications deployed to, this was before Kubernetes, so it was uh, Mesos Marathon in the, these data centers. Uh, so there were uh, path, uh, you know, path rules in the each Jenkins job to say, if this file, if this directory structure changed, okay, then this pipeline kicks off, all that kind of thing. So each pipeline, each build had uh, that explicitly defined. Um, so because of that, that was one of the last Jenkins instances because we, we had a few and that was one of the last ones we could not get rid of because drone didn't have a good way of supporting that. So that's what drove writing that extension so that what we ended up, uh, what we could then do with that extension was we can have you know multiple pipeline, you, in your drone YAML, you can have multiple pipeline stages, uh, you know, different separate unique pipelines, right? That can run on, you know, optionally different, completely different machines. Uh, and that's what we were able to do. We were able to uh, run uh, a runner in each data center with different labels. And with a pass plugin, we were able to say, okay, uh, this, because this was a mono repo, by the way, that where all the configuration for these uh, applications deployed into Mesos Marathon um, were in either one directory or another. And so if someone makes a change in one directory, that has to get deployed and executed on one runner on one <laughs> in one data center on one side of the globe and make a change to a different directory, it has to execute on a, a different runner on a different side of the globe. Um, and yeah, so that by having that plugin, uh, we were able to automate that and get rid of our last Jenkins instance. So nice. Yeah, we had a similar problem where we we had all of these regions across the world that we wanted to deploy to it. We went about it a little differently. Um, we we're following more of the GitOps pattern where, you know, gets the source of truth and you're pulling in everything into your, your cluster in our sense. 
Cool. Uh, so apart from, so we just talked about uh, that extension. Um, any other customizations or add-ons that you've taken advantage of? Maybe pipeline plugins or anything like that? Yeah, like we we like drone because it's so flexible and easy and you can just write a little step or even you know package that step in its own type of container that you can run really easily. So we've done that a lot for any of our orchestration and tooling or anything that we want to spin up a little bit quicker than you know doing a full install in an empty container step. Um, but we've done a lot of other cool stuff too. Uh, one of the things that somebody on my team worked on, more recently was migrating from disk to memory builds, which was really cool. Um, we had a monolith repo that was running and it would take forever for builds to happen. And after some investigation, we found it was due to limiting IO. So in cloud providers, when you add a disk to a machine, you're limited by the size of the disk. So if you have a hundred gig disk, you might only get so much IO out of that disk. And if you want more IO, you have to have a bigger disk. Uh, that's the case with GCP anyways. And we would run into IO uh, limitations quite frequently. So to save money and to you know, try to speed things up a bit, we decided to switch to memory builds. So we changed the Docker configuration in drone to do inbuild memory. And if you need more memory than is actually there, then it will spill over into disk afterwards. But the memory hack that we did actually speed sped things up a lot. We went down from we went from 10 minutes and 48 seconds to two minutes and 24 seconds for our monolith build, which was pretty crazy. For some of our other microservices and stuff like that, we, we ran the same test again, and we went from about five or six minutes down to about three, three and a half minutes. So that was still a big improvement that we got kind of across the board by allowing in-memory in -memory builds. That's awesome. Uh, was that then a RAM disk? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've used those at, at some point. That's cool. I guess that shows highlights like one of the advantages of um, self-hosted CI environments where that might have been more challenging in maybe a uh, cloud hosted environment where like, of course you can, you could bring up your own uh, runner with as much memory as you want uh, mm -hmm. in your cloud environment versus this, maybe, maybe something like Travis or circle. I don't, I don't know how, what kind of environments they give you if, if you have the ability to um, increase the memory that you need. But um, it's totally up to you what kind of runner you want to use when you have drone in your own infrastructure. Um, and you don't have any uh, maybe memory limitations like you might have in, in other tools that, uh, that might say, no, <laughs> this thing is using way too much memory. I'm going to kill it. <laughs> well, we did the cost analysis too. And for doing builds, you don't really need a huge disk, right? Like, are you going to need a hundred gig disk to do a build? Probably, probably not. You probably need maybe 20 gigs or, you know, something a lot more reasonable and you could do that in memory and get a lot faster improve, uh, performance increase. So that was something that we were really proud of. And, you know, Neil on my team did a great job at rolling that out to, to everybody and, uh, doing the deep investigation that it took to make sure that, you know, it was cost efficient and performant. Very cool. Um, you may have already, uh, well, well, we, I was going to say, uh, if there might be any notable pipelines or workloads, I mean, we just talked about one that would certainly <laughs> meet that definition, um, but any other uh, notable pipelines or workloads that you can think of that you have going in drone? Yeah, absolutely. So definitely our monolith migration, like we've been trying to containerize the monolith for development environments and for testing and 
you know, eventually pushing that into production for a short period of time while we're splitting off other services into microservices. And we're almost there, we're getting there, but there's still a need for this giant monolith to be containerized. So that was definitely one of the big notable pipelines that we did. We also migrated that all into drone from Jenkins. Uh, something cool also that we did we we use drone services a lot for doing some integration tests and spinning things up to run tests within a pipeline. But at one point, we wanted to expand on this a little further. So what we did is we did integrations with Tilt. I'm not sure if you're familiar, familiar with Tilt.dev, but amazing tool for interacting with Kubernetes and spinning up development environments on the fly. So what we did was we did integration between drone and tilt and we're able to kind of orchestrate a deployment of tilt CI in the background and deploy into Kubernetes and then run all of our integration tests against Kubernetes namespace and then shut everything down afterwards. So this was some cool work that we did with our monolith to kind of move that pipeline and keep everything in Kubernetes. We do see some differences between running containers in services in drone versus directly in Kubernetes as like a native pod namespace deploy, deploying it the exact same way that we would through either, you know, either customize or Helm charts or direct Kubernetes YAML. So we wanted to mimic that as much as possible and have drone just kind of be the orchestrator of all of that. So that was one thing that we did. Um, the other thing too is our main internal developer developer platform abattoir is also all you know linked into drone and drone does a lot of linting and automation and orchestration for that. Um, I actually sent you a link earlier. Maybe you could share the yeah, I was gonna say this is this is this the time to share that. Let's yeah. share that now. We wrote a blog article on this last year, and if you guys are interested, you can take a look at achievers.engineering. It's our, it's our blog space for all of our developers. Um, and I write a lot of articles here too, but uh, you know, this, this kind of goes over the journey of microservice tooling. And when you move to Kubernetes, you have a lot of dependencies. You have a lot of things that you need to bring into a centralized place for your service to configure. And this was kind of our solution to that. Um, so if you scroll down a little bit, there should be a diagram, keep going down. We'll see that, yeah, this guy here. So this is kind of how a lot of our developers workflow would work. So a developer would use their local machine. They can use Tilt and talk into Kubernetes. They also use Drone for doing builds, testing, sending notifications, um, doing interaction with your artifact repository, whether it's you know Artifactory, Nexus, whatever it might be. And then you have cloud services. So you have to kind of integrate all of your microservices into cloud services somehow. So we use drone to kind of orchestrate some of that. That's great. Yeah, okay. a lot of services. good information in here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing this. Um, I was gonna say that uh, the services are definitely a really handy feature of, of drone in a pipeline that, um, you just define any container. It can be just can be started as a service that uh, comes up and runs to the end of your pipeline. Um, and in my previous company, we would one of the neat ways that I, I saw teams using that was they would uh, they would run the containers of other teams' apps as services to, for their integration tests. Mm -hmm. uh, and because we had you know some private repositories. Um, that that could have been challenging, uh, but since we had uh, you know automated the way of authenticating, like they didn't have, there was it was no overhead for them to like just run another team's container from their private registry. They just put it in, and it just worked. Yeah, we exact same kind of case we use sometimes is spinning up another microservice, or say you want to do some testing with Redis or something more common. 
uh, that might be a service or a database, you can set those, those all up as services that run in the background before you actually execute any steps to those services. That's cool. Uh, I will uh, stop sharing that for now. And I feel like there's an opportunity for some kind of show notes or something, because we talk about a bunch of different uh, topics that um, yeah, people might want to find. Maybe it'll be in the uh, YouTube video links uh, description. So no one has to guess as to what we're talking about. Um, so if I was uh, at Achievers and I was uh, on team bringing up a new, creating a new app, and I wanted to write a drone YAML to uh, execute my CI pipeline, what would my what would my process look like? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. We've templated a lot of our stuff out for our engineers, whether it's something like canary deployments or even drone pipelines. So if an engineer was to start a new microservice for the first time, they would run a boilerplate to create basically a hello world app out of the box that they can edit, change, however they see fit. We can pretty much get a drone pipeline up and running and the service deployed into production within 10 to 20 minutes, probably. Like it's pretty fast to get a hello world out there. And that includes a full build test uh, full test suite and deployment. Uh, so, you know, that's a number that we try to track on a regular basis to make sure that we're able to push things out really quickly, start up new services quickly. Um, you know, we want to move a lot quicker than we did in the past. And this is one of the ways that we can do that. It's a great KPI that teams can actually keep to and measure is time to production for a new service especially when you're onboarding new engineers and they need to know the tooling, um, having this kind of automated process to create a Hello World app is a great way to show new hires how you use your tools, whether it's turning on drone for the first time or you know, integrations with Argo CD or just a deployment in general. So it's, it's quite fast for us to deploy something into production if we wanted to. Uh, engineers can also use drone locally if they want and use do, uh, drone exec to run things locally. We don't have everything set up to run full suite tests that way, but some people do write their own drone files from scratch and maybe they only want to run it locally. So these are all open for teams to make that determination on their own. Uh, for microservices themselves that go into our main platform, we do require it to run in the drone server and follow a certain set of standards. Uh, and that's all templated out basically for us ahead of time. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the uh, drone exec subcommand. So there's a drone CLI. Um, we should mention that is uh, just a binary, a Go binary. Um, and one of the subcommands is exec. And when you run it, you get very close to the same kind of behavior as you would see if your pipeline actually ran in a running drone uh, pipeline in with a, on, on an actual runner uh, with interacting with a drone server. But, but you don't have any of that. You just have uh, your, your CLI and you're just running that one command. So you have to tell it, you know, it, it needs your code, it needs to know a few things that I don't remember off the top of my head. It needs to, your drone YAML, of course. Uh, I think you have to tell it if you, you're simulating a, a commit or a pull request commit or something like that so that it knows which steps should be included or, or not. But, but yeah, once you do that, it's all console output. Um, you don't get a web interface or anything, but uh, it's all console output of each step in your pipeline running in containers uh, with Docker. And yeah, it's, it's extremely close to what what would run for real. Uh, so that really helps out, like you said, with something that someone just wants to run locally or it's a way to debug um, maybe something that's failing in your drone uh, pipeline that you, know, you can figure out faster if you're running it locally and, or it's a way to try out something new locally without actually having to make commits in your repository. So yeah, it's really powerful. 
there's a lot of stuff going on. We could just have, <laughs> uh, uh, we could have a, an hour long conversation just on the CLI, I feel. Yeah, we, we honestly <laughs> love drone. We use it every single day in different capacities. Um, it's, it's really great. Like we, we've used different parts of it. As I said, we use the server. We try to integrate it with everything that we do. Um, you know, it, it hasn't all been smooth sailing though for us. Like we have run into some problems in the past. Like I was mentioning with the Kubernetes runner earlier on, we were running into a lot of performance problems. They've since been resolved and, and fixed, but you know, we, we've had this three year journey. We were able to touch a little bit of everything there and see really what works best for us. Um, everyone has different edge cases and use cases. So uh, it, it takes some time and understanding to figure out how the tool is good for you in, in your specific cases. That's great. Um, curious if we mentioned Jenkins. Um, yes. Are there, have there been uh, other CI tools in use at Achievers? Um, like why or why not? Yeah, I mentioned it a little bit earlier too. We use Tilt. It's not really a CI tool, maybe. I, I don't know. Uh, it's a developer tool, um, but we do use it in CI mode, which means it kind of continuously runs in the background. And we do integrate it with Drone on top of Drone, and we use it locally. Uh, so we really like Tilt as well. It's one of the most powerful tools we have in our, our tool set. Um, so with the mix of, you know, we're moving off of Jenkins, we're getting rid of Jenkins, it still kind of exists, but it, it's going away this year in the next couple months. There's already a whole plan for it. We're trying to use drone as much as we can. Um, not a CI tool again, but we do use Argo CD as for continuous deployments anyways. And we follow the GitOps pattern and we have basically all of our clusters around the world pointing at a repo and when things change, they get repl replicated down. Um, we also try to embrace eventual consistency with that model. So that way you don't have to update things right away. It will eventually update and within a certain amount of time and we, we track that. Yeah, that's great. That's uh, something we definitely wanna highlight more that Drone and Argo, um, they're both tools you can self-host on Kubernetes. And yeah, they work really well together. Um, there are, so it's something you can run on your own cluster. You don't have to use a cloud provider uh, that might be handling some, you know, some of that for you. Yeah, there's, there's definitely not more opportunity to talk about those being used together. Yeah. Um, Cool. We are uh, 45 minutes in. We're having uh, a good time. I feel <laughs> this is fun. Um, there are uh, any uh, questions you might want to ask us or bring to the drone community? Yeah, um, absolutely. So like, I have a question for you because like, this is a big change for you. You used to be writing code every day. Like, as I said, I found you on GitHub, GitHub on some of the integrations and tools that we were using. So how do you feel now about doing, you know, something a little less technical in the sense of writing code? Yeah, no, uh, um, I, I, I jumped at the chance uh, when Brad, you know, sent it my way um, because I had been doing, so I feel like at, when I was at Meltwater, yes, I was writing code. I was doing, um, I was running services, running drone uh, as kind of an internal, platform team, DevOps team, you might call it, uh, for Meltwater. So I was doing a lot of, um, you know, developer advocacy-like work. I was doing a lot of, uh, you know, creating drone training materials, examples, um, helping people with questions around pipelines and best practices and that sort of thing. Um, and I really enjoyed that. Um, but not <clears throat> very little of it ever became public. Uh, and so I realized, you know, hey, this is a chance of, to do things more uh, in, the, in the public space, uh, in, the, in, in the drone community versus, uh, you know, what I had been doing was, you know, was great. Um, but yeah, it definitely a chance to get it. 
out to a lot more, a much wider audience and, and, and see what it was like. It was definitely a, a chance to try something different where I had, I had come from a principal software engineer role. Um, when I was at Meltwater, I was there for seven years. Um, so I, I did really like it there. It's a great company. Nothing, nothing bad to say about it, but, um, and I still do get to write some code. <laughs> um, I've, I've been working on the drone helm charts, uh, getting those to a better place. Um, and I have other areas where I'm hoping to write more code. Um, I don't want to make any promises <laughs> in case anyone's like, oh yeah, he's going to work on that project. Uh, but we'll see, uh, we'll see where it goes. But no, I still, I get to work more directly with uh, Brad and the drone developers. There's another really nice uh, advantage and, um, and working in this team that we're building. This was, this is a team that, uh, started with just a couple people. And now I think we're nine people. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been great. That's really awesome. Yeah. That's cool. Cool to hear and see your journey as well. Um, let's, let's give a shout out to Brad, right? Like the one man show for all of these years, like he's, awesome he's put together such an amazing tool and you know i've i've chatted to brad a little bit in the past and he's just a wealth of knowledge because he's literally built the thing from the ground up so shout outs to brad the one man show um this kind of links into one of my my next questions too in the past i i always felt like the community was so active and and thriving in the past and i've noticed a lot lately, it's kind of degraded a little bit in that sense. And I, I'm just kind of curious what Harness's plan is for the continuous investment into the drone community. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. It's definitely something people notice. Anyone in the community, it, it, it comes up fairly often uh, since I've started, I've noticed. So, I mean, I think me being hired, I think was a good step. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the fact that this uh, job became available and uh, I was able to fill it, I think uh, I'm, I'm one step along that path, I hope, uh, to, to making things better. I've been, you know, working on those helm charts, that, like I said, I've been uh, trying to be more active uh, in the Slack, the, the, I believe it's harnesscommunity.slack.com uh, if you want to join our Slack community uh, in the drone channel. Uh, I'm answering lots of questions in there, uh, helping a lot of folks. So, you know, I can, I'm here, I, I can only do so much though. Um, so as far as the, the drone developers, they are, they, there are three now full-time. Um, and I don't think it's fair actually to say they're full-time. They, they do work on some other things within Harness. Uh, Brad is of course still involved, um, but he, his time is split with some other things. Uh, they, the drone team does now have a, um, I don't know if project manager is his title, but you know, someone that's going to really help them, uh, prioritize and, uh, filter through all the work. And so that's, that was very encouraging to me. So I think the answer is things are going to get better. I don't know how fast they will get better. Uh, but certainly, you know, if, if you have a pull request, if you have a, feature of an issue that, that's important to you, bring it to the Slack room, bring it to um, our discourse, which is harness, uh, here, what is it? Uh, community, community.harness.io. Uh, and we will do our best to uh, you know respond and get things moving along. Um, so that's, I think the best answer I can give. I hope things are going to get better. Yeah, that's good. Like it's it's hard when an open source tool gets bought by a company or gets like consumed by a company. Uh, you know, there's always these kind of growing pains that you kind of have to go into. It's just nice when you don't uh, when when we don't lose track of the vision of community involvement, right? Like a lot of these tools thrived in a community they were moving a lot quicker um and then you know even with our own products things slow down when there's product owners involved and integrations that need to happen and 
you know, things get slowed down. So it's, it's nice to see the momentum in the community continue with drone because that's one of the reasons that brought us the tool in the first place and other tools too. Like the Argo community is really awesome. The Istio community is really awesome. These are all other tools that we like and we, we, we're, we're old school Linux sysadmins, a lot of us. So we, we like that community. We've been part of those communities for years. So it really draws us to a tool when that community is active and contributing. And yeah, so it's, it's great to see you even do these kind of talks because it brings us a lot closer together with the company and the uh, community. Yeah, I'm glad you feel that way. That's definitely um, part of the goal here is uh, get more conversations happening and uh, interactions and just showcase that, you know, drone's not going anywhere um, and, and find out where, where we can put the, uh, the most effort and get the most uh, benefit. So, yeah, we were just, um, you know, talking a bit about contributions. Um, I was going to share a few things uh, since uh, I think it's probably getting to the end of our time in this uh, first office hours. Uh, I wanted to share that I uh, mentioned the Helm charts. Um, they are now uh, published on Artifact Hub and they are officially listed where they have this fancy official badge so this is a nice, if you're not familiar with Artifact Hub, it is a, it's a nice way of uh, visualizing and, uh, and working with packages. Uh, I believe, you know, they, they have Helm charts. I think they have support for other package formats. Um, so it's easy to see uh, documentation and versions and that sort of thing all in one place. And I want to give a shout out to Vice Ice on GitHub. This guy really helped make this happen and help to push forward. And this is the exact kind of thing we're talking about, getting more community contributions, getting them uh, integrated more quickly. Uh, so this is, this certainly happened here. Here's an example of it where uh, he submitted um, some pull requests in, in this issue to, to make this not uh, get over the finish line. So I really appreciate it. Um, the other thing I wanted to plug before we go is that uh, Unscripted is happening this year in person in September on the 14th in San Francisco. So if you can attend, registration is free. Uh, there will be some virtual components um, if you can't be in person. there We still have um, call for papers open uh, through the 15th. So if anyone has anything they want to submit uh, around drone, that would be awesome, um, or other topics please do it because we'd love to have you. And um, yeah, if you're finding this through another means, through another channel, just know that uh, we have an official meetup uh, of the Harness and Drone user group where this is happening. So if you want to be involved more when the and, and know about when these uh, are, are going to happen, you can find them here. And of course, we have a official uh, Harness YouTube channel where all these videos get posted. Uh, we just had a meetup around uh, the Detri plugin that happened this week. Uh, that's a great talk and relevant to rel related to drone if you didn't catch it before. Um, any other questions uh, for maybe anyone out there? Going once, going twice. Cool. So Stefan, I did I also I didn't want to forget to ask where we can find uh, the content that you put out. I know you, you write you're writing um, quite a few blog posts. You, uh, Platform Conf is happening today, right? And you're part of that. Yeah, actually, uh, Platform Con is happening today. It's a virtual event. It's totally free. Um, I think they have like. 80 talks or something over the course of the two days and it's totally virtual all online uh definitely go check it out i'm sure there will be some name drops for drone in there somewhere we, we use drone in our uh in my talk so uh yeah definitely take a look at it um and as jim mentioned i write a lot of blog posts on different topics more so around distributed systems scaling globally 
a lot of stuff around Istio right now. So uh, that is all available on achievers.engineering. It's our Medium blog. You can also find out more information about Achievers if you're interested in culture at achievers.com. Awesome. Anything else uh, like your Twitter you might want to plug? Or... Uh, I'm S-T-E-K-O-L-E -E on Twitter and pretty much everywhere. So you guys can find me. Uh, and yeah, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn if you have any questions. I, I love talking to people about cool technology and what everyone's working on. Awesome. Well, yeah, thank you again, Stefan, for doing this. Um, I think this was a really fun first office hours. I uh, couldn't have gone better. And uh, hopefully we get to talk again in the future. Absolutely. Thanks so much for inviting me. Thank you. All right.